I have a very creative way for you to invest in real estate and we're going to talk about it today. Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode in Nova Rice and you heard that right. Today we're going to talk about another creative way to invest real estate. And what's special about this type of investment is that it combines two of my favorite things, food and real estate together. Now, the way we're going to go about this episode is that first we're going to look into what the business model is. Then we're going to go over the benefits that your tenants will get out of it, plus the customers of your tenant. Because if your tenants receive customers, that translates into money for you because they're going to have revenue to pay your rent. Then after we understand all of that, because everything is about customer satisfaction, the more happy customer, the more revenue you get. Once we get that, once we understand their needs and want, then we're going to go over the benefits that you will get to receive as a real estate investor in this type of investment. So without further ado, let's just jump straight into what I have prepared for you today. And here we have an article courtesy of the Wall Street Journal. And you read that right, food hall. So we're going to talk about food hall, which happens to be a hot real estate investment that is conquering the suburbs. All right. So now before I continue diving into this article, I want to take a pause and talk about the concept of a foot hall versus a foot court because they might sound the same, but they're not exactly the same. So a foot hall, what makes them different? Well, a foot hall doesn't have chain restaurants. These foot halls have independent restaurants and they typically serve ethnically diverse cuisine, meaning international cuisine. You can hop on one spot and you'll find, let's say, Peruvian cuisine. Then you can find Japanese. And then over here you can find uh, Italian food. It's very, very diverse. And they're operated by independent business owners, like regular mom and pop restaurants. And food halls not only serve food, but they also provide an experience. They aim to basically replicate the experience that you get when you go into a restaurant, call it for a date or for a nice experience or for a business meeting. Now, you take that and then you compare that to food court. That's a complete different thing because food court is what we're used to seeing in the malls, right? Like you go down to the lowest floor of the lowest floor or usually it's all the way at the top of um, the mall and you will find restaurants that are not necessarily independent, but they're part of big change restaurants. So you'll find restaurants like Olive Garden or maybe Chipotle or McDonald's or Friday's brands like that. OK, now that you understand that, let's get back to the article. So now food halls, once a staple primarily of big cities are rapidly multiplying in the suburbs as developers aim to capitalize on the rise of hybrid work and foodie culture. These collections of small restaurants typically have shared seating and offer a variety of gourmet and ethnically diverse cuisines. They target customers who are willing to spend $15 on an artisanal sandwich or one meal from West Africa or one inspired by Asian open air markets. In contrast to food court and highway rest stops or older shopping malls, food hall operators generally avoid national fast food change and waffle chair seating. Uh, food halls favor local restaurant, craft beer, and modern decor. Now, I want to pause here for a second and talk about what we just went over. Maybe depending on your background, depending on your budget, you might find expending $15 on some tacos a little bit of um, an overbore experience. But you have to keep in mind that they have their target audience defined. They are not targeting families who are actually on a budget or restaurant eaters who are on a budget who want to go to a food court. They're talking about an experience. Someone who wears a nine to five, who has the flexibility to work from home. Those are typically customers who are more affluent. They have nine to five jobs that pay a higher salary and therefore they can afford to go to those type of restaurants. And keep in mind that when you're working from home, it doesn't necessarily translate to having more time to cook because depending on your line of work, sometimes it can be just as demanding as being in the office. And when you least expect it, it is already time for you to grab a bite. And let's be honest, cooking also takes time. So sometimes it's easier to just hop in a car or just go downstairs 
walk over to the food hall and just that walk in itself allows you to sometimes, not always, but sometimes to clear your mind and just take a little bit of a break from being locked up in the apartment or in the house. And why not? At the same time, you get to enjoy a nice meal during that break and then you get to go back home. So just for, for thought right there. Now, continuing with the article, their growth has been explosive. The U.S. has at least 364 footholds and more than 120 are expected to open by the end of next year, according to real estate firm Cushman and Wakefield. This is actually a great opportunity because that means that this is a business that's actually still growing, like it hasn't been overly saturated. And if you take a pause and think about this business model, this is not that different from what we're normally used to. So let me just take a step back and talk about the traditional real estate investing that most of us are accustomed. So there's typically the residential and then there's the commercial. And when we talk about commercial real estate, people typically think about offices or they think about shopping malls, right? And I know there's a lot of noise in the news talking about the death of commercial real estate, that they're on their way out, what's gonna happen to all this commercial space, uh, it's gonna be the end, no, 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 no. It's not the end. It's just simply the end of a business model. And now we are experiencing firsthand the transition, the evolution of what used to be commercial real estate investing into this new way of commercial real estate investing. And I know you've read in the news that shopping malls are dying, right? But if you come to think about it, this business model of a foothold, it's actually very similar to a shopping mall. Because when you think about a shopping center, what do you think about? You think about the Target, and there's a Home Depot next door, then there's a supermarket, there's a nail salon, and all these little businesses joining forces to make up a complete shopping mall. Well, that's not that different compared to footholds because what you're seeing right here is, let's say we take a big lot or um, a big building or structure, whatever you call it, and then you're taking this big lot or this big property and then you're dividing it into little chunks and now you're having multiple different restaurants that just happen to be in the same field, which is the food industry. So you got a Mexican restaurant over here, a Chinese restaurant over here, a Japanese one, an Italian one, another gourmet restaurant, a tapas restaurant over here, an African restaurant over there. And what you are getting out of this as a real estate investor is that you're actually mitigating the risk. You're not relying on one business to survive in order for you to survive. Now you're actually diversifying because you are dividing your piece of land or your piece of property and you're collecting rent from multiple different businesses. So if one cannot pay your rent at the end of the month, you got all these other businesses who are still up and running and therefore continue to provide that revenue that you so much need to continue to keep up, whether it's with the commercial mortgage that you have or with the expenses or the upkeep of that property in itself. Now, back to the article, let's keep scrolling. So we last left off on the expectation that 120 more footholds are expected to open by the end of next year. And that is more than 10 times the number of footholds that were open a decade ago when only 35 operated nationwide. And a large chunk of those were in New York City and catered to tourists and office workers. And yes, being a resident of New York City, footholds are actually pretty common here in the city, especially in areas where their office is located because of the demand of the multiple people locked up in offices coming out here in search of a different type of food, not necessarily uh, the usual uh, chain uh, type of restaurant. And as we continue with this article, we can see that today these footholds are scattered everywhere and they provide different examples. So we have Omaha, Nebraska, and where they're featuring a Nepalese street cuisine and Syrian fare. There's another foothold in Grapevine, Texas, which is designed to look like a rail station. And they sell arepas, thus as international as it can be. Arepas is one of the most traditional food in Venezuela and Colombia. And they also sell briskets, as well as seafood and hummus. Yummy. And there's also another example here. Uh, we see Reno Public Market Foothold in Nevada, and where they have vendors selling churros, delicious, 
Krebs, and Salvadoran Pupusa. So you kind of get the gist of it, right? But things don't end there. And here is the nice tweak to the entire thing. So when you think about foothold, you typically think about lunch and tourists. But what they're doing here now in the suburbs is that they're creating an experience. This is more than just food, right? They're trying to keep everything running for longer hours because if restaurants were to survive only with lunch money, they're not going to make it very far. But if these restaurants can stretch it all the way to dinner time and a longer, then we're talking about more money, more revenue for them. And that's exactly what they're trying to do here. They're trying to create the experience, that experience of going to a festival, a bar, without necessarily having to go to a bar. And me personally, I actually love that because it saves me time from having to drive around or move around, especially in New York City when parking is actually very difficult. In this case, the entire foothold experience entails you walking in and enjoying food, right? You can actually do food hopping. You can stop by, I don't know, uh, to sample a little bit of Italian food. And then once you are done with that, you can move over to the taco place. And then once you're done with that, you can go over to another section where they might have a live band and offer drinks. And once you're done with that, you can move over to dessert. Or even better, you can actually have your friends go over to the dessert place and bring the dessert over to you when you continue to enjoy the live band. And that's exactly what they are showing here. For foot halls to succeed, they need a popular bar and event, such as live music or trivia nights that attract customers beyond the lunch crowd. If you leave it at nine to five, you're not gonna be happy with the results. It's all about revenue. Now, I'm gonna move on to a section where we'll talk about the reality of these things because not everything is perfect. Not everything is picture perfect. Just like with everything you do in business, everything has its ups and downs. And a question that I anticipate some of you might be asking is about the startup cost of an investment of this type. Because typically when you invest in real estate, there are some additional expenses that you need to account for because you're dealing with businesses. So what I'm gonna do is to go over those expenses here, just to show you how similar they are to investing in commercial real estate. So according to this article, investing in footholds also demand a significant upfront investment from owners who build out the small kitchen and buy the equipment used by each food vendor. So that's not much different from the typical shopping center, right? Uh, whenever a business signs up a lease, it is also the responsibility of the business owner to build the space in a way that can help them do business. So it looks like in the case of the food hall, it is very similar because it's what we are reading here. The owner of the property needs to provide the kitchen equipment or whatever equipment that they're gonna need and um, the everyday business, right? So they provide an example right here uh, where they talk about the old state food hall uh, off the I-95 in North Carolina and the owner tech foot hall also pays for the utilities and maintenance. So it looks like the type of investment that you make up front is not necessarily a cookie cutter, but it will be determined based on the area and the demand. Um, but based on what I see here in the article, the foot hall, which opened last year as the first piece of a 3 million square foot development isn't yet profitable. Um, the expectation is that things are gonna change once other projects kick off, including residential, retail, co-working, and hotel uh, come online. Meaning that if you plan to invest in this type of businesses, make sure that your foothold is placed in an area where you anticipate will have good foot traffic or just traffic overall, because you definitely don't wanna open up a foothold in a suburb with families who don't necessarily appreciate the experience of going into a foothold and paying for $15 tacos, right? Depending on where you're tuning in, you might find $15 tacos very affordable. Me, personally, I live in New York City where you can find a taco truck and you can find tacos for as little as $7, sometimes even $3. So $15 taco sounds very expensive to me, but for the experience, it might be worth it, right? Okay, now back to the article. The journal also mentions other footholds that are actually very popular in New York City, such as the Chelsea Market and Italy. 
and being a resident of New York, I happen to be very lucky to visit both. And I find the experience actually quite nice to be able to go there and experience different type of food and drinks with the nice experience. So let me know what you think. Is this something that you're actually exploring? If so, how would you go about it? Let me know down in the comments and I will see you in the next video. Take care. Bye-bye.